great to have all of you here today here and uh, welcome those that are watching and worshiping online here. Uh, today is special for a lot of different reasons here, but uh, uh, God is here and we are glad to be here, a part of this worship time here. All right, we, we begin as we stand and uh, sing our song of contemplation. I will ple pr praise him still. We make our beginning in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, and let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and to one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So we pray. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. And so I announce to you, Christians, today that Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake, forgives you all of your sins. And as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We remain standing as we sing our next song. <laughs>
may be seated for our readings. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel I will plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar, and under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches. Birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. Dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading, our epistle reading, uh, comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, through, uh, verse 1 through 10, and it's based off of facing death with confidence. That will be the theme of Pastor Reiner's message this morning, and it is based on the words from Apostle Paul to the Corinthian Christian. For we know that, it, that if the tent that is, our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that What is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel. And he said... I apologize. This is from Mark chapter 4, verse 26 through 34. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may remain standing as we uh, join in with singing our next song, I'm But a Stranger Here, 748.
may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. So glad, good to have you all with us this morning, and we're going to talk this morning about the blessing of, of death, of all things, right? Uh, we can be confident in the face of death. That's our theme this morning. There was a man who talked about Jesus a lot because he loved Jesus. Wherever he went, he would talk about his Lord. On this particular day, he was doing that, talking about Jesus loud and clear. The people didn't like it. They scorned him. They warned him. He kept on talking about Jesus. And finally, they led him outside the city to stone him. Stephen, and you, you probably know about Stephen, right? Book of Acts. He stood strong and confident in the face of his death. He says some beautiful words. He said words like this, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And after he saw Jesus sitting next to the throne of God in heaven, as he looked up into the heavens, Stephen said some amazing words. He said, Lord, do not hold this against them. Do not hold them against this. For he was being stoned to death. And yet he faced his death with confidence. How can that be? How can we do that? Because after all, all of us will face death someday. There's, there's a guarantee, not just taxes, but there's also a guarantee of death. We will all die someday. But how can we face death with confidence? That's what 2 Corinthians 5 is all about. And that's what we'll talk about this morning. So I'll turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and, and begin. Because we can face death with confidence when we realize that we're living in a tent, in a tent. Listen to these words. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Two times in this verse, Paul is referring to, to his body as a tent, as a tent. Now, Paul was a tent maker. That was his way of making a living, wasn't it? He made tents, so he knew a lot about tents. Do you know a lot about tents? What do you know about tents? Well, let me share four thoughts about, with, about tents. Number one, a tent is what? Temporary. It's not made to live in all of your life at all. It's very temporary in nature. Um, in fact, there's very few people who live in a tent longer than a week. How many of you have lived in a tent longer than a week? A few of you? How many of you have lived in a tent for, for, a mo for at least a month at a time? I mean, all in one time, a month. A few of you. Not many of us. Most of us regard a tent as very temporary. Very temporary. And that's our life, is it not? That's the way our life is. It's very temporary. Some of you young people may think, oh, yeah, it's going to last a long time. Yeah, you just wait until, <laughs> and you'll look back and you'll say, boy, my life went fast. This is temporary. Yeah, it's temporary, all right. It's very temporary. That's number one. A tent is temporary. So are we. So are our bodies. Number two, secondly, a tent is insecure. It's very insecure. It may keep out rain for a while, right? For a while. It may keep out the sun for a while. But eventually, 
the tent begins to de deteriorate. It's very, very insecure. Our lives are very insecure, are they not? I mean, we don't know when we get up in the morning what we're going to be like when we go to bed at night. It's very insecure. Um, we don't know about next year, for most of us. Are we going to be living next year? We don't, who knows? We don't know. Um, our lives are very insecure. A tent is very insecure. A wind didn't come along, and there goes my tent. Uh-oh, there goes my tent. Or the river may come up, and we're camped next to the river. The river may come up, and uh-oh, there goes our tent. It's very insecure. <coughs> Number three, a tent also what? Wears out. It wears out. The ropes begin to get soft. The texture, the, 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 the textile begins to uh, lose its waterproofness, and on and on and on and on. Eventually, now we happen, Janelle and I, and Janelle can attest to that, she's here, we do have a tent that's um, 47 years old. <laughs> now we haven't used it for eight years. It's in our basement, so it may, it may not be usable, I don't know. There's a Sears Roebuck tent, but that's a kind of a record. A tent wears out. Our bodies wear out. Is it, if it isn't cancer, then it's heart disease. If it isn't heart disease, it's Alzheimer's. And it goes on, on, on. We all know about that. Our lives wear out. Our bodies wear out. Um, our, thin gets sk our skin gets thinner, right? We barely hit it on our fingers on something, and it bruises, and on and on and on. And number four, a tent isn't all so comfortable all the time, is it? It's not very comfortable. The floor is hard. The ground is hard. Mosquitoes get bad inside the tent. Then what do you do? And on and on and on. A tent isn't always so comfortable. Neither is our body so comfortable always. As we get older, our aches and pains begin to appear more and more and more and more. It's like this. This is, this is from 2 Corinthians 5, 4. Paul says, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. And that's true. So long as we are living, we groan and are burdened. Things that make this life uncomfortable, sickness, illness, disease, and so forth, are present. But we can face death with confidence when we realize that we are living in a tent. That's number one. That's what Paul says. Number two, we also realize that death is a, a blessing. And that's from um, Revelations chapter, um, chapter 14, verse 13. Let me read that for you. This is the, this is the writer of Revelation saying this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor, and their deeds will follow them. Death is a blessing. What? Death is a blessing. How so? How can death be a blessing? Well, let me share four thoughts with you, four things that are, that are going to happen to you, to me, in the next... I don't know how many years, but these things will happen. Number one, our spirit will depart from our body. Our spirit will depart from our body. In other words, this tent that we're living in now is going to wear out. The skin, the heart, the head, the mind, everything's going to wear out. And death is when the spirit departs from the tent, from the body. That's when death occurs. That's when my life, when Daryl Briner departs from this tent that he's in now, that's when death occurs. Where will the spirit go? Where will Daryl Briner go? Where will you go when, when you leave go of your tent, 
you leave go of your body. Where will you go? You'll go immediately to the Lord. That's number two. Your spirit will, will depart immediately to Christ, to God. Here's what 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. At home with the Lord. That's where your spirit will go. That's where my spirit will go. It'll go home with the Lord. Didn't we just sing a few minutes ago, heaven is my home? Yeah, right. It's our home. That's what it says. That's what the, that's what the, what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians. That they have, they, when, they, when their spirit leaves their body, then their spirit will be at home with the Lord. And then number three, the third thing that will happen is that when Christ returns, when Jesus returns in the final day, we will all receive new bodies. We'll receive new bodies. Just like Christ resurrected from the grave and he received a new glorified body, so you and I, when Christ returns, will also receive a glorified body will have a body back again. It'll be different than the first body, obviously. It won't just be a tent. It won't be a temporary thing. It's going to be a, what's the opposite of temporary? Permanent thing, eternal thing, something that'll last forever. This body isn't meant to last forever. It'll last 70 years, 80 years, 90 perhaps. 100, maybe. But the body that we will wind up with when Christ returns, which he has promised, will be a perfect body. That's number three. And then number four will come God's judgment, which, which, which he talks about. Um, let, let me go back to, at, to get back to Second Corinthians five. Let me read for you these words. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You see, there's going to be a judgment. The judgment. It's going to be a judgment for the non-Christians. It'll be a judgment of sin. For those who do not, do not believe in the forgiveness of their sins, it'll be a judgment of, of their sins. But for the Christian, it's going to be a judgment of the grace of God because they believe in the forgiveness of their sins. And so they are forgiven of their sins. And their sins will not be held against them anymore because of Christ. But there is going to be a judgment. There's no doubt about that. Again and again, the Bible says there will be a judgment at the end. But for us as Christians, it's a judgment of God's grace, God's love, God's peace. Because we believe that God loves us and gave up his only son to die for us on the cross. And when we believe that, our sins are forgiven. Our sins will no longer be judged against us because Jesus paid the price of our sins. That's the blessing we have. That's the blessing we have. So we can face death confidently because death is a blessing for all of us in the end. And then number three, death is also, we can also face death confidently because we can eagerly anticipate eternal life eagerly anticipate. Maybe I can ask you right now, how many of you eagerly anticipate eternal life? All right, a good number of us. Some of us don't yet, but you will eventually. As you get older, perhaps, you'll begin to anticipate eternity, anticipate a time when there's no more taxes, no more lies, no more deceits. Let me share something with you. I, I found a, a it's kind of a, a poem. 
I don't know who wrote it. It's kind of cute. Here it is. Talk about anticipating heaven, anticipating uh, the time when we'll be with the Lord forever. Listen to this anonymous uh, poem. No dust, no rust, no rats, no rot, no raucous rock, no potent pot, no growing old and weakened sight, no denture slipping when you bite. No bombs, no guns, no courts, no jails, where all succeed and no one fails. No strikes, no layoffs, full employment, and everyone with job enjoyment. All tell the truth, state only facts, no wars, no debts, no income tax. According to this dream of mine, in heaven no one stands in line, and there are only smiling faces and lots and lots of parking places. I look forward to going to heaven, I eagerly anticipate getting my new body. I look forward to seeing those loved ones who have gone before me, my mom, my dad, my grandpa, grandma, and of and meeting and talking to Paul and Peter and James and John and millions of others. I long to live in a world without sin, sorrow, and pain, and I look forward to praising Jesus with millions of believers and singing amazing grace, how great thou art, with Jesus standing right in front of us. That's amazing, isn't it? That we can all anticipate that. And we can face death with confidence when we do that. We anticipate the coming of our Lord. What a blessing. And then number four, we can face confidence, we can face our death with confidence when we believe that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Do you believe that? Listen to these words from um, 2 Corinthians 5. We know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. You notice the comparison that Paul makes here between an earthly tent, which is what we have now, right here, the comparison between that and the eternal house. Temporal tent, eternal house. That's... These are Paul's words. Then he goes on and says these words. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Guaranteeing what is to come. You know, it's like going on a vacation and driving and driving and driving into the night. And you're tired. And you pull up this motel and you confidently walk into the motel with all your luggage. But how do you know you have a room? How do you know you have a place to put that luggage? Well, it's because you made a deposit. Maybe you called in a couple days before and you gave them your, your credit card number or you, you paid for the room and you know it's paid for. And so you confidently walk into that motel with all your luggage without even asking, is there a room available? Because it's guaranteed for you because of your deposit. Well, guess what? Somebody made a deposit for you in heaven. You've got a guaranteed place in heaven. How do you know it's guaranteed? Because the Bible says so. God made a deposit there that you can be sure of that and certain of that. What was the deposit that God paid for your room in heaven. What was the deposit that God made for your room in heaven? His son, Jesus, right? He made the deposit. His blood was shed, so you have a guaranteed place in heaven. <coughs> guaranteed for you. The deposit is there. The best is yet to come. Absolutely. Let me share a story with you before I end today. It's a story I've used before, yes. All my stories are used before. But I don't know, I, but you probably don't remember this one. I'm glad for your forgetfulness. But here's the story. There was a woman who had been diagnosed with cancer and had been given three months to live. Her doctor told her to start making preparations to die something we should all be doing, of course, all the time. So she contacted her pastor 
and asked him to come to her house to discuss her funeral. She told him which songs she wanted sung at her funeral, what scriptures she would like read, and what she wanted to be wearing. The woman also told her pastor that she wanted to be buried with a fork in her hand. The pastor didn't know what to make of this last request, a fork in her hand. So the woman explained, in all my years of attending church socials, potlucks, and functions where food was involved, my favorite part was when, the, when whoever was serving away, was clearing away the dishes of the main course, would lean over to me and say, you can keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew something better was coming. When they told me to keep my fork, I knew that something great was about to be given to me. It wasn't jello or pudding. It was going to be a cake or pie or ice cream. Something with substance. So I just want people to see you there in that casket, me with a fork in my hand, and I want them to wonder, what's with the fork? Why does she have a fork in her hand? Then I want you, pastor, to tell them something better is coming and keep your fork too. At the funeral, people were walking by the woman's casket and they saw the pretty dress she was wearing, her favorite Bible, and the fork placed in her right hand. Over and over again, the pastor heard the question, what's with the fork? During his message, the pastor told the people about the fork and about what it symbolized to her that something better was coming. Well, folks, members of Trinity, guests, friends, something better is coming. The best is yet to come. If you think, if you think you have enjoyment in this life with your meager tent you have on, with your tent that rots and spoils and decays, anticipate the time when you're with the Lord. What a blessing that will be. The best is yet to come. May God grant that to all of us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let us all rise as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today with gratefulness. You have blessed us beyond belief. We don't deserve faith. We don't deserve life everlasting, yet you give us faith in Jesus as our Savior from sin. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we could live forever with you. This life is not all there is. We look forward to life even after our death. Thank you, Lord, for making your kingdom begin so humbly in our midst. You make it a place of welcome and shelter for all, even for nesting birds. Thank you for not overwhelming us with your glory and power. Make our faith and love grow like cedar sprigs and mustard seeds to your glory and for the good of our neighbor. Lord God, we thank you for the people you brought to our neighborhood picnic yesterday. Thanks for all the volunteers who so willingly brought food and cooked hamburgers and manned the Bouse House. And so many who visited with our guests we love to be your hands and feet. We have good news to share. Please work through each one of us as you will to bring glory to you and to show love to our neighbors. Plant this congregation firmly in Christ, our living water. May we abide in his love, share in his forgiveness, teach his commandments, and share in his righteousness. Thank you for the staff and volunteers you give us to help carry out your work here at Trinity. Thank you for guiding Pastor Brian Lee to a decision. May your will be done here at Trinity and around the world. 
we lift before you the Christians around the world who are persecuted for your name's sake. Let their suffering yield a rich harvest of faith, love, and forgiveness. Shield and defend your missionaries, especially when they are met with hostility and rejection. Teach our earthly rulers to walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Teach them to delight on your law, to meditate on it day and night, and to establish it as the source of justice, truth, and well-being among all people. Please keep us in your care, and please keep in your care all who defend life, liberty, and justice. Teach them your commandments. Fill their minds with wisdom, their hearts with integrity, and their arms with courage and strength. We humbly ask you, God, to give comfort to the sick and lonely and to those who mourn. You are the Lord who feeds and nourishes us with your wisdom. So help us to turn to you in faith and find our every want and need answered in your gracious favor. Please hear the prayers of all who are in any need, especially those listed in our bulletin. We pray for Mike and Vicki and Sharon and John and Jimmy and Kay and Kendra, Dawson and Joe, Sam and Arlen and Rogine and Tom. And Lord, also please bring an extra measure of comfort to those who have lost loved ones. May they know your presence and your peace. We lift up the friends and families of Delbert Stark, Shirley O'Brien's brother who died of pancreatic cancer just recently. As we grow older day by day and as we reflect on the health problems, as we reflect on health problems life brings, we remember that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heaven. In this tent, we groan, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. But even with all the problems of life, we're always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. This life is a blessing, but we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Someday in your time, you will take us home to be with you. Until that time, we make it our aim to please you. Thank you that heaven is our true home and that you've made a way for us to live forever with you because of Jesus. Hear and graciously answer our prayers, dear Lord, and deliver and preserve us. For to you alone, we give all glory, honor, and worship and praise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We stay standing as we sing our final song, Cornerstone.
seated. A few announcements here. And uh, see here, Trinity Bible Adventure Meeting is this Thursday at 6.30, so if you'd like to help out, volunteer with that here, uh, you may certainly do that here. Father's Day gifts are available again in the, in the narthex here, uh, sold by uh, our, uh, our um, Thimble Club. And then, re and then next week is when we, we need to have you guys return the Hope Pregnancy Ministry baby bottles next Sunday here. And um, while Carl is coming up here to make uh, an, an announcement here, um, also too, tomorrow is the senior dinner at uh, 1230. And uh, in case you're confused, on Saturday, we are not having another neighborhood bar barbecue, so just ignore that, that one on this coming Saturday. But anyway, uh, Carl. Thank you. We heard uh, good news in the sermon this morning, and we've also got good news to share with you. Friends, this is a letter from uh, Pastor Brian Lee. Friends at Trinity Kalispell, grace to you and peace from God our Father. I am honored to have received the call to be lead pastor at Trinity. It is a profound ministry and a magnificent comfort that the Holy Spirit has promised to do his work through all of us, his children. As we considered the call, God's word was our first resort. He has promised that he would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Diane and I have prayerfully asked for the Lord's guidance and his blessing. We have prayed for Trinity Kalispell and St. John's Algonquin, our family, and for the growth of God's kingdom among all of us. I have decided to accept the call to serve as your lead pastor. We are excited to join you in Kalispell. May God continue to show his people the immeasurable riches of his grace in, G in Christ Jesus. In the victory of Easter, Pastor Brian, Diane, Madeline, Caleb, and Rebecca Lee. So that's good news. Thank you. Yes, it is. Great news. Uh, if you see a bigger smile on me today, that's probably why. So anyway. <laughs> Don't forget, there is confidential prayer up here by, by Stephen Ministries, as always, and have a great day in the Lord.